My husband and I, uh, for many years, lived in the Albany, New York area. And there was, um, my husband uh, and I um, moved to the Adirondack Park um, for, for a job that he had at the community college in Saranac Lake. And the first couple of years were a little bit hard. Um, I was lonely, you know, being a transplant. And I had been doing paintings a lot about memory and, um, you know, my personal experiences. Um, and I just decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. And I thought that I would um, paint other people. You know, um, it was in 2016 when um, uh, there was a lot of <coughs> stuff going on. And I noticed my neighbors were planting flags. There was like a lot of arguing in the post office. Um, people were taking down other people's flags, you know, and it was just, I was, you know, like really upset thinking, where have I moved to? What have I done? And, um, and so I just started to talk to people about what they were thinking, what they were feeling, what they were experiencing. And um, it just, their stories intrigued me. And I decided to uh, paint the stories. I, I said, can I paint this story? You know, this is a weighty topic. Can I make a painting about it? And everybody I asked um, said yes, you know. So um, a lot of these paintings here are, are um, of my family and friends. Um, this was one of the earliest paintings. Um, this, is, this is actually not a family member or a friend. Um, it was a student that attended the college that I taught in. So this is her response in her words um, the, uh, about the death of Trayvon Martin, you know. And, you know, being one of very few um, people of color in Saranac Lake, she really felt isolated, um, and she had a lot to say. And um, this, these are also students. Um, the title of this is Watching Human Rights Silently Legislated Away. These are my students. This is Megan and Mia. So what I learned from them was just their take on gender and gender identity. Um, this was another student. Um, this was my, my husband's student. The invisibility of my race, hashtag Native American, hashtag no child left behind. So these are weighty issues. I think that what I learned through this work is that, you know, the stories that the media sometimes tells about rural people is not complete, you know? Um, and so these are, I call these, these voices, rural voices. And the more I got out into the community, the more I learned, you know, the fuller story. So I used to capture moments on my smartphone and I had an iPad that I, have used as well in the past. And I take multiple photographs, sometimes 20, 30 more. And, um, you know, I wait for the light. I wait for just the right pose. Um, and, um, and then I put the work together. I put the painting together myself, you know, uh, just combining parts of one photograph and parts of another photograph. A lot of drawing. I look for light. Um, for me, it's a metaphor. It, um, 
you know, it's, I, I want people to, to be struck by, by the scene, to be drawn to what the people are saying, you know, and as well, um, light is a great way to craft an image that's three-dimensional, you know, so it doesn't look photographic in the sense that it's flat. And it also gives me an opportunity to render the form with drawing. So the photograph won't give a rendered form, but I translate the photograph into a rendered form by um, paying, paying attention to edges, by simplifying structure. Light is a metaphor for what? Illumination for me, the light, the darkness, you know? I think that for, you know, for my people, their, um, their ideas and their story comes from deep within, you know, um, their soul, if you would have it, you know. Um, and so that's really what I'm trying to capture. I'm really hoping that these paintings can change people's minds, you know, about each other. We, we sometimes we'll check somebody out and we'll just assume some things about them. We don't always think, you know, that, you know, let's have a conversation, you know. We, we tend to just judge a lot. You know, I do have a, a painting that I just love this is of my father. I think it was a week or maybe it was a couple of weeks. I'm pretty sure it was a, a week um, before he died. And he was so skinny. My father, he was in his 90s, but he was pretty sharp, you know, and very strong opinions. And um, going back to the to the digital media question, that's how they're part of how they're created, but it's also a, a repeat subject matter. In many of your works, you've got the ladies on the phone, the husband and wife on the phone, people looking at the computer, writing a letter through the computer, listening to a podcast, looking at the computer, reading the news. Um, why do you think that keeps coming into these works? What does that do for you? So for me, it, it really reflects what I see a lot, you know, where I live. You know, people in Saranac Lake on the streets, we've got a phone, students, they're on their phones. Also, I feel like it's a way for rural people to connect to, um, you know, um, the stories that are happening nationally. I notice that my students don't watch the news on television at all, but they, they read online newspapers. So honestly, I'm not really, I don't go in with a plan. I don't, you know, I don't decide I'm gonna paint this type of person or that type of person, or, you know, I'm gonna have to include, um, media, it just kind of, it just happened as a way for me to get to know the people that I was, you know, living next to and with. The quotes, some of them are completely theirs. And sometimes I work with them. Like I'll, they'll say, I want to say this. And it's like three sentences. I say, I can't, I can't do that in the title. But, but the words are completely there. The narrative is theirs. My husband um, is an English teacher, and so sometimes he will punctuate <laughs> <laughs> or change spelling. He can't help himself. He also corrects my grocery list spelling. I know how to spell vacuum now. <laughs> sure. my, how long does it take you to do one? Oh, that's a really good question. So... <laughs> Um, two months, start to finish, two months. So, and that includes taking multiple photographs, 
talking with the people, making revisions. Sometimes I put something in and then I paint it out. You know, so it's a process. Um, sometimes I change the light. Sometimes I'll add light. So by the time I'm, you know, I'm done, it's usually about two months for this size. For the eight, the, the 24 by 36, um, that's like maybe two and a half months. And the super large ones, that's about four months. You know, and I work uh, in sections. So I, I'll, um, I can show you over here better because there's lots of detail. I'll maybe work that section and then I'll work, I work left to right, right? Top to bottom. I'll do another little section. If it's something hard, like what was in here, um, you know, that might take a day. So I, I work from general to specific, like we were all taught in college, but I do it in a section. So when I'm done, I typically don't go back in. Um, and this painting is taking a knee for justice. Larry and Jan, they, they've been married for 40 years. Larry's grandfather was lynched in Alabama. Larry said, you know, I, I will always take a knee for justice, but I won't step foot in Alabama. And he, his son lives in a state where um, their son, where he um, would, would um, have to drive through Alabama, but he doesn't. He adds an extra five hours to go around. So this is John. He was a police officer, and he did two tours in Iraq. He came to our college to major in art. He was uh, a single father. Um, he did two degrees, one in fine arts and one in graphic arts. Um, this is his daughter. He's, uh, his, his wife died, so he comes home from Iraq. He's a single dad to two teenagers, and we would disagree on lots of things, uh, especially guns. I said to him once, you know, John, um, how does your daughter feel, you know? And he says, oh, she doesn't like it. I said to him, you know, someday, John, um, she's going to change your mind. You know, our children change our minds. And he's just a nice guy. And when, if you saw him, you know, with his tattoos and, you know, I don't know, you might think differently. And this is our son, Matthew. Six things you know you need to know this morning. He's always reading the newspapers online. And he was uh, instrumental in saying to me, Mom, don't watch the news on TV. He said, you need to subscribe to these newspapers. That's all you need. And this is my husband. The moment you understand white privilege and decide to act for the greater good. We donated a lot of food and whatever we could during COVID, making sure, you know, that people weren't going hungry. So the reason I use cradle hardwood is that's what I can afford. I can't do a painting and frame it. You know, it's so expensive. And so, and I don't want to paint on canvas with a raw edge and then have to buy a special frame for that. So it's cost saving. Um, the reason the paints have so much texture is also started out as a cost saving device. I would put paint out on my palette and I would, um, at the end of the day, like I would paint for five or six hours and that's enough for me, you know, I have other things, other responsibilities, right? And so I would put the paint in the freezer. And um, I didn't know this at the time, but freezing paint 
it, yes, it stiffens paint, which is what I liked. It slows down the drying process. So you just get a thin skin on the paint. I learned this when I was at Golden, the, that residency, and I would stir that paint in, um, in the skin into the paint. I liked it because I noticed people would say, oh, those are photographs. Like if I would take slides and send them to a show, people wouldn't realize that they were paintings. They just, you know, dismiss them and think that they were photographs, you know, because they are looking at lots of people who are applying to show. But then I would do close-ups and say, no, this is paint. Like it draw the, the texture draws attention to th that it's painted. You know, and so I just left that. It kind of happened by accident because I'm cheap, you know? <laughs> truthfully. I'll have all my palette colors and I'll slap it on with a palette knife. And I use real inexpensive uh, Blick, bright, sa they're called sable, but they're fake sable. And I never, I, and I hold the brush at a like 30 degree angle and I drag the color through. So the color mixes on the paint. You know, doing a whole painting, a little here, a little there, a little there, I'm lost, you know? But if I can say, okay, I'm just gonna focus here, and I throw the, the paint on with the palette knife, and I've only got this to think about, then I feel like I understand it, you know? And that was something I learned in high school. My teacher would say, I'd say, I don't even know where to begin, my high school art teacher. And he would say, well, just then divide it up and just do a little section at a time and don't worry. And that just was a process that I stuck with. So you have a skin and this is um, the start of a new body of work. Um, this is Diana, and she's uh, an emergency room doctor at AMC in Saranac Lake. We sold our house in Upper J. She and her husband bought it. And um, we got to know them when Roe v. Wade was, you know, I asked her about it. And I asked her from a physician's point of view, what? I learned from her that bodily autonomy is, is really important to doctors. And her perspective is that um, women are losing their bodily autonomy. The, the, she said, a doctor always asks the patient what, should ask the patient, what do they want? These are your choices. And um, she's saying that her doctor colleagues in, in some states, right, um, they are, uh, they're not able to ask the patient. They're not able to help even with ectopic pregnancies, you know, and that women are dying. These are remnants of hospital bracelets. She's thinking about these, her, these patients. I wanted to, to show a green face to signify, you know, death, dying, illness, but death has no no color. This is my ceramic teacher. She was 26 years old. She is an amazing ceramic artist. She was living in the in uh, Elizabethtown. She had lots of people very uh, aggressive toward her. But you know, they, people don't think that's somebody's daughter. She's tw she's in her mid 20s. She's you're frightening her, and she ended up leaving and going back home. So and I try to tackle weighty issues, but not be in somebody's face or not be offensive. You know, I want people to think. And I, my idea is that, um, you know, just read their story and just sort of think. You make up your own mind. What I'm trying to do is not reinforce the narrative that media tells about rural people, you know, because we, we all know what the, what the narrative is, that we're very, that we're very conservative people, that um, 
Sometimes we lack diversity in thinking. You know, that's really what I'm trying to, um, to counter. Not in an angry way, but just to, you know, to say these rural voices are rising. 